Hey friends, welcome to another episode of the Power of Nine podcast. I am your host, Aaron Eggert. Today's guest has been affectionately dubbed the gratitude geek, and I'm confident this episode, (laughs) you'll understand why. We're going to geek out on all of that and more with my guest, Janice Gray. Janice, welcome to the show. Thanks, Aaron. It's good to be here. So nice to see you. So nice to see you too. Uh, I am very happy to have you on this show. And I just want to start out by addressing the elephant in the room or the oh. Zoom room. The Zoom room, which okay. is uh, your name, Janice. So uh, you and yeah. I chatted about this in some prep. And mm-hmm. I I had to ask your partner at the time, or partner Kevin uh, yeah. Campbell, how the hell do you say her name? Like, <laughs> I want to say, uh, I want to say, well, now I don't even know how to say anything else. So you said yeah, Janice, don't try. which I have a hard time getting Janice out of that and, yeah, and whatever, no. but so it's Janice. So explain to me yeah. how you, so you spell it J A N I E C E. Yeah. And how yes. do you get Janice out of that? Yeah. So my parents got super creative and really, I I think I got to blame the grandparents before them um, because my grandparents put their names together, William and Bernice, and came up with Will Niece, which is my mom's name. And God bless her. She goes by Niecy, which is what I would go by too, if I were her. And then Will Niece and James, they put that together and they got Janice. But I married a Jason. So we're all done with the name, (laughs) name combos, all done. So you're, you're, you're stopping it. And, uh, do you have, uh, do you have any siblings? I do. I have a brother, uh, he's about four years younger than me. And what's your brother's name? He has Jim. He's like a Jim <laughs> junior, Jim seniors, my dad, like they weren't super normal. And my grandparents, you know, my grandma died this last year during COVID and, um, not from COVID, but she died in the last year. And I realized when you and I were chatting about this, like, I don't know what possessed her and my grandpa to be like, all their other six kids begin with a B name and somehow they got a wild hair on my mom and decided to do this name combo and then never did it again. And I don't <laughs> think I ever asked her, like, what were you thinking? Uh, so, isn't anyway. Families are so funny. Like if oh. people do the crazy stuff and that is a great story. Yeah. So uh, I know you've mentioned your, your mom's name, Nisi before. So yeah. I've heard that. And so now yeah. I, I, but I never know what her full name was. So that's good. Yeah. Uh, thank you there for you filling go. me in on that. Yeah. <laughs> So we were doing a little, we were doing a little show prep and there's a guy, I learned so many things about you. So I've known you now for a couple of years. Uh, you and I worked together. You actually hired me to do some consulting work right. for a while. And then we became friends, uh, mm-hmm. as we should. And then now you're a facilitator for coalition nine, and we're going to get into all the other amazing things that you do besides, uh, lead our coalition, one of our coalition nine groups. Mm-hmm. But so I didn't know. So I for right away just assume a uh, great shot of your mug there. Thank I just you. had to give a little selfless promo there for Coalition cool. 9. Seems like Thank the appropriate you. moment to take a sip of coffee. It was. So uh, <laughs> for those of our listeners that didn't watch this on video, she's got her Coalition 9 <laughs> mug rocking today. Uh, you are so you're you were born in Pennsylvania and mm-hmm. lived there for a while through your younger years and then transitioned here into the Twin Cities. Uh, what do you remember about being raised in Pennsylvania and being raised in that area? Oh, I loved it. I mean, I, when we grew, when we moved here, we just so missed the mountains. Cause I was in like mm. central and Western Pennsylvania. We kind of moved all around out there and that's where both of our extended families were for both my mom and my dad's side. So moving here mm. was like a really big deal. Um, and yeah, I loved Pennsylvania. I went back out there for a year of school. I kind of always thought I would end up back out there. And uh, gosh, I've been here 30 some years now. I, yeah, I right. don't think I'm going back. So yeah, it doesn't here we sound are. like it. Yeah. Why did you why did your family decide to move uh, to Minnesota from Pennsylvania? My dad worked for Ecolab and this was their mm. um, is still their like world headquarters. And so oh. it was kind of a promotion and then he kind of moved up another other places so yeah and so you grew up in uh the twin cities here what area of the twin cities did you grow up uh bloomington so yeah. jefferson high school yeah jaguars uh, that, yeah <laughs> go jaguars uh yeah. and then you did say you went to after after high school you did go back east and went to college for a little bit uh what what kind of brought that on yeah you know of all the places that we had lived kind of all over pennsylvania i really loved pittsburgh the most. And that's mm. to this day, if I 
I think if I was ever to move back there, that might be where I would go. Um, and so I went to a small school not far out of, outside of there. And um, I was there for a while, but I had gone on like a, like a service mission trip to Guatemala the summer before I went into uh, my freshman year. And it just kind of changed everything. And I didn't want to be in, you know, a business degree in marketing and communications anymore. I wanted to do something that helped people. And so I decided I was switching to social work and you have to be in an accredited licensed program mm -hmm. and they didn't have that. So I transferred back here and went to Bethel. Went to Bethel. Uh, so how was that experience at Bethel? I know a couple of friends that went to Bethel and they, and I think people that go to Bethel, like really love it. Like it's one of the, isn't it a Mayak school? So it's, it is. it's, you know, so it's, a, it's one of those liberal arts schools, but yet you have so many different things from a culture standpoint that enhance your experience. Would you agree with that? I would, I would say my experience was really a bit more challenging though, having transferred in. So I think mm -hmm. if you go and you have that freshman experience and you make all your friends, I had done that, but they were all out in Pennsylvania. And so like breaking into kind of that bubble as a sophomore is not the easiest. Um, but I absolutely agree. I think the opportunities afforded to me, like I had an amazing, I got an amazing social work degree, great opportunities to do internships and, and get a great job after. Um, I did a lot of like volunteering and like service learning kind of things around, um, like there was a it's called the listening house, kind of a homeless drop-in shelter during the day. And we would just go there and kind of hang out and talk to people, that kind of thing. And so there were a lot of great opportunities to get involved, I think, in the community. And that's something I did really appreciate about my time at Bethel. So you've, uh, I'm totally going to take a left turn here just because my, my brain fired. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I told you that it, this is, there's no predictability the to, where, to where I go with this. So I I, you had mentioned this a few times about okay. service and giving back and community. So you've said those words a few times yeah. and now, and I've, as I've gotten to know you over the last couple of years, you've, you've done a lot of mission trips and you do mm -hmm. a lot rooted in giving back. Where do you think all that came from? Um, well, I mean, I, I grew up, you know, our faith was really important to us involved mm -hmm. with lots of churches, stuff like that over the years. So I think that was a big piece of it. I think my whole friend group in high school and whatnot, like we just did that kind of stuff. Yes. It was like through our church and out into the community, mm -hmm. but I think that was a really big way of kind of expanding the bubble that I lived in, in, you know, prestigious West Bloomington or whatever you want to, you know, yeah, rip right. on it for. So, um, and so for me now as an adult, um, our family like is, is involved with different communities, but like, it's been super important to me to take my kids and offer them some of those same opportunities. So I've actually, all three of my kids are fluent in Spanish because of a mm. Spanish immersion program. And yeah. so I've had the opportunity to travel with them to Guatemala now several different times, the most mm -hmm. recent being February of 2020. So there's something about that to go and do that and like watch your kids expand. Um, that just was an amazing opportunity for me. So we, right. you know, try to find different ways to get involved. Well, it's fantastic. I mean, your whole, everything we're going to dig into here is kind of rooted in that in, in giving mm -hmm. back. And so we'll get back to our reg regularly scheduled program here, about <laughs> your, your journey. So you decided then after uh, college, you were going to go work as a social worker again, yeah. rooted in giving back. Right. And so mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that experience and what you decided to do moving forward. Yeah, so right out of the gate, I had done an internship at the Struthers Parkinson Center, which is part of um, kind of an outshoot of uh, Methodist Hospital now with Health Partners. And um, I was a social worker there, and they had created a position for me, actually, because I'd been the intern, and then they wanted to hire me, but they didn't have like a full-time gig. So I had to be half social worker, half, um, what was my title? Anyway, like fundraiser person for the Parkinson Association of Minnesota. And so I knew nothing about running a board, fundraising, running events like that, but I learned a heck of a lot as a very young 22 year old. And it was so schizophrenic. Like, I don't know, I didn't love the combo platter because um, I still remember there was this one day I had to run back to a different phone because like they had to have separate offices. And I was talking to Dave Ryan from KDWB. He was literally <laughs> on the air 24 years ago. And um, I he was going to like MC one of our events or our runs or something. But then like I hung up the phone with him 
And then I like darted back up to my little office and I had to like sit down and compose myself and like try to counsel and walk with a family through like a new diagnosis of Parkinson's. And especially for younger people and especially 20 some years ago, that was a pretty devastating and difficult disease. And so it was so schizophrenic. And I was like, I don't like this. I don't know which part I don't like. Um, So I decided after two years there that I would go back to school and get my master's of healthcare administration. Um, Because I figured I could get the administrative side, which I was doing a good job with in the Parkinson Association. And I just figured I would like get the master's in social work somewhere along the way. And um, I fell in love with the healthcare administration part and just never went back on the social work side. So Nice. Nice. Where did you take it uh, and go to from there? Um, so I went to the program here at the U, which was like, still is one of the top five programs in the nation, but I was just dumb luck fell into it. Cause my husband was in grad school here. Um, so anyway, I graduated from there and I went to work at Abbott Northwestern hospital where they had a 20 year history of an established fellowship program and a fellow there, you do like administrative projects and stuff for like a couple years. And they're kind of training you to be an administrator. Um, so I did that for about a year and a half and then kind of launched into a career at Alina, uh, after that. So what is a, uh, I, I'm, I feel maybe like an idiot asking this question. Maybe no. our, our listeners know what this is, but what is, what does a healthcare administrator do? That's a good question. Cause I think right. people have a sense of like, what do doctors do? What do nurses do? Yeah, but yeah. like administrators, what are they? Yeah. Um, so think of it like the, uh, like the CEO of a hospital, right. Or the, um, I wasn't the CEO of a hospital, but I was a director of operations. So one of my first jobs out of my fellowship, um, there's a center for outpatient care down on 169 and 494. We built that building. We moved the medical practices in there. Um, myself and other people were on the leadership team of that to like help bring new business into the building. So new, uh, subspecialty practices, right? Like orthopedics isn't subspecialty, but like other physicians that would come in so that we could have as many services as possible there for the patients and families that came. Um, So I kind of like run all of that, right? You have to deal with the budgets and you got to deal with the marketing and the um, just kind of the operations of a healthcare facility. That's kind of what healthcare administration does. Yeah. Yeah. And then when did you make the decision that you wanted to start getting focused on being uh, the whole patient experience side? Yeah. Yeah. So I, it was after I had my first uh, child, um, I got to the point where I didn't want to be like in the office at 7am waiting for a physician or surgeon to like fly through the door and like be pissed off about something in the OR. Like that just, that wasn't working for me as much anymore on the family front. Um, So I moved over into an internal consulting role within Alina and I got trained as a Lean Six Sigma person, which just means you go out and do like performance improvement projects. And I know tons of people in our coalition nine community are really familiar with, I think some of those PI type concepts. Um, So I did that for a little bit. And then they said, Hey, we've got this thing called patient experience and we don't really know what we're doing with it. Like, will you come and figure out what's going on and see if you can make it better. And that launched into just like this really cool synergy of almost coming full circle back to the the social work part of where I started. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting to just watch how that all finally came together. And um, I ended up like leading a whole department of people and doing a lot of um, communication coaching with physicians across the entire system. Um, And I just really fell in love with that part of the work. Kind of like where I was meant to be, I think. Yeah, how long did you do that for? Uh, Patient experience part at Alina was about two, three years. Um, and I started to get a little restless because, um, well, I would honestly, like, I would have to go pay my own way to go speak at a conference and kind of brag about the organization and the work we were doing. And people would come up to me and be like, oh my gosh, you're like coaching doctors. Like, how do you get them on board? And how do you do this? And blah, blah, blah. And like, it was like, great. And I would come back into the organization and there were leaders at that time that would do nothing but slam the work that we were doing. And so I was just like, I, I got to do something different. And by this time I've now had three children. So like life is uh, a little crazy. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, anyway, one day um, you mentioned Kevin Campbell, my uh, partner at DTA, uh, our co-founder at DTA. Um, he, he asked me to go to coffee at like the little maps coffee shop in the, the midtown uh, global market. And he's like, I have an idea. I'm thinking about leaving and starting a consulting company. And sassy old me is like, 
well, I'm leaving anyway. So sure, I'll go with you. <laughs> so yes. naive. So, so sassy. you got, yep, 15 minutes in, you were in. <laughs> <laughs> Cup of coffee, it's all took. Yeah. And actually what I did say to him at the time is, um, <laughs> he wanted to convince our then uh, boss to go with us. And I was like, well, if you convince her, I'm in. And he did. And eventually the three of us left and started a company together. So it was pretty crazy. Yeah. So talk about what, what was DTA then? Um, and uh, what was the brainchild about bringing you all together? What was the, the, the genius in the room between the three of you? Yeah. So we all had worked together in this whole area of kind of performance improvement. So uh, Kevin and I first met when we were being trained as like Lean Six Sigma black belts. And the idea is that we're bringing together the quality, the data and analytics, um, because Kevin's a, um, a amazing data architect and could kind of, build, he built the data warehouse that Alina has. And then I led the patient experience. And if healthcare, especially 10 years ago when we were doing this, was all about the triple aim and kind of bringing together that cost quality and patient experience. And so it seems like we really had this energy on that. And we had done some amazing work within the organization and we just wanted a chance to do more of it with other people and kind of just spread our wings a little bit. Um, and so that's why we launched off. Yeah. And as you were going through your journey with DTA, you, you know, that's the entrepreneurial journey. There's always bumps in the road of that entrepreneurial journey. And, uh, and you had, uh, you had a, an agreement with your partners, partners at the time that mm -hmm. one of your partners was going to peel off. So uh, how did that all come about? And, and what was that experience like for you? Yeah, yeah, no. So the three of us started the company. And, you know, we had the best laid plans, right? When we, when we jumped out of our day jobs, we were going to, you know, consult with another company for a while while we built our business, the good old fashioned way. And like all things um, that fell apart within a few hours of giving notice. And so we really had to truly build it the good old fashioned way. Um, but we did, and it was amazing. Um, and we got to just a point where I think in an evolution of that, I guess we were probably four or five years in one of the partners was just like, I, I don't want to do this. I want to do this other thing and, and wanted us to come along. And um, I, I couldn't go do that just with where I was at with my family and wanting to be with my kids and or at least have some sense of that. And so um, anyway, we agreed and worked through the, I don't know what you call that, right? It's like a partnership evolution. disillusion yeah. process, it's, right? It's, it sounds I, pretty I awful. No, I would, it's evolution, right? So there's, that happens with a lot of different organizations. People, people sometimes grow out of it or grow into yeah. it or, or things like that. And I think that's, you know, that's healthy as long as yeah. you're focused on what's best for the organization and for each individual involved, you know, it probably was for the best. Yeah. 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 Oh, and in the long run for, I think for all involved, it absolutely was. You're absolutely right. Um, and so then we kind of continued on and like, I should probably stop and say that, like, starting a business or owning my own company was, like, not on my radar ever. Like, that had yeah. never been ever part of it. And so, you know, we were four or five years into this. Well, then, you know, there's, like, certain roles you have to play within the state of Minnesota and, like, documents. And so we needed a new CEO. And, like, so that became me. And I was, like, what? Like, I don't know. This is not what I am. So anyway, but I took it on. And so I led the company for the next, I don't know, four or five years. Um, and it was great. We did patient experience work. We did data and analytics and data warehouse, um, data governance. I mean, an amazing, amazing team of people uh, together. Um, so yeah, I got to lead that company. But I think there was, I was starting to sense some things kind of changing in the market because mm -hmm. um, I don't know, there was just... <sighs> people were into this patient experience journey now another 10 years. And so some of them were like hiring from within. They didn't always want consultants to assist them. So we weren't seeing some of those things play out the same way. Um, and I also went off and got um, certified as an executive life and leadership coach. So I was like doing some coaching training because we had always done this like physician coaching and nurse coaching and whatever, where we're like communications mm -hmm. coaching, following them in the exam room. And 
you know, coaching them on their awesomeness and the one or two things they could do differently. But I, I wanted to be better equipped because I was seeing a lot of burnout among those healthcare administration people we were talking about because mm-hmm. um, it's a hard industry. And this was pre-pandemic. It was hard. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and so I wanted to be able to support them better. And so that's why I went off and, and got certified in this. And as a part of that, when you're being trained as a coach, um, especially if you're getting certified and all this kind of stuff, you have to be coached too. And to be a good yeah. coach, you need to have a coach, right? I've heard you say that yeah. on this podcast before. Um, yeah. So I had a whole bunch of like, free coaching slash therapy and kind of got clear about myself and just kind of what I wanted in life. And, um, we were at a place where my husband and I both were traveling, like, like consultants do. And we had these three, have these three amazing children. And it was just like, this is not how this was all supposed to go. And no one would voice disconcert with it except for me. And finally I was like, well, my voice matters. If no one else is upset, I'm upset. I don't want to do this. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Anyway, that coupled with finding the market changing uh, for patient experience just felt like, I don't know, I just feel like there's something that kind of got to give. Um, so I approached, it was actually right after a meeting with you one day, I, uh, not that you knew about it, it was just, I remember where we were, which conference yeah, room I was yeah, in. Yeah. <laughs> um, I approached my uh, then partner and co-founder at DTA and was like, dude, we got to talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it was a really, like, I think because we had been through that other evolution process, and I think we both had learned a lot in that process, this time, uh, we just knew how we wanted it to go. And we wanted to, like, be friends at the end of it. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's not that there's not hard conversations that you go through in a process like that. But I think as two people could, we navigated it better than I think most do. And so at gosh, it would have been like March of 2020 is when I um, ceased to be the CEO at DTA and became an executive consultant and just co-founder. Like just, I was there for that part and to still do the patient experience work that we have because we have some ongoing, you know, work and clients. It's not that it's not an industry. It just wasn't um, my full-time gig. And then I started a executive life and leadership coaching practice and I incorporated which is, which on the eve su- of a global pandemic. <laughs> right. Which is, which is successful, Facts. which is successful. So I, I, I want to touch base <laughs> on a couple of things DTA related before we transition to J Gray and Associates. Yeah. So one of the things that you said to me uh, about the transition out of the CEO role mm-hmm. of DTA was that you, af- after your, your parting ways with your other partner, your third partner, you and Kevin committed to each other uh, a vow of transparency. And I thought Mm -hmm. that was really like, that was something really special. I I felt like, I just felt that in your voice when you said that to me. And Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that transparency that happens in partnerships, partnership is hard. I don't care what, what kind of partnership it is. It could be life partnership. It could be business partnership. It could be whatever. There's always work to that. But I think that vow of transparency made that made that better. And I think that that's, um, I just want to point that out that I really yeah. like the fact that you said that, uh, and that you both agreed upon that. Second, yeah. I don't is, know if Kevin would say it quite that, like that sounds super formal. It's a vow of transparency. So those right. are, but, but you know what I mean? Like we committed He's, to really being yeah. honest with each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, we all are saying the same thing. It's just, we're using different words. Uh, and then the, the, so what does DTA do now just before we, so we close mm-hmm. the loop on DTA and, and put a bow on that before we transition to yeah, Jay Gray, absolutely. what does DTA do th- doing these days? So we still have an amazing data and analytics team that do everything from build and architect a data warehouse. They'll help put in together uh, data governance strategies for organizations to kind of manage what they do have within their um, data structure. They also do a ton of um, one of their best amazing things too is kind of outsource data management. So we'll do some outsourcing for data warehouse and other, other sources. And then they have some really cool tools. Kevin's amazing and has built several tools right now in particular um, there's something called Compendium that you may see out there through DTA, and it's a product, it's a business intelligence, cat, intelligence catalog uh, that Kevin built many years ago, and organizations that have used it loved it. 
and Sweet. he's in the process of taking it to market right now for DTA. So it's super cool. I'm super excited for the, the data team. Um, and I still lead our patient experience practice. So, I mean, this whole time, uh, even during the pandemic, I was doing patient experience consulting work for several local and national organizations. So that's still a component. Um, we still have people reaching out for that. We still have the ability to provide those services, not just through me, but others we can bring in as needed. Um, so yeah. that's still another component of what happens at DTA. All right. I'm Good. in fact, uh, I'm going golfing or top golfing with the team this afternoon, weather permitting. Are you? Yeah. Well, th there's top golf is different. It's well, it, just so everyone knows it's going to rain today, but, uh, so know. it is a good thing to go top golf. Top golfing is so much different than regular golfing. Hmm. I went to top golf a couple weeks ago and oh my gosh, it almost like if you're a good golfer, don't go play top golf because it'll make you worse. <laughs> I tell you, like it, it kind of levels the playing field a little <laughs> right, bit. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, okay, so let's put that. All right, we put a bow on the DTA uh, on the what DTA does. So J Gray and Associates, which I love the fact that you chased your passion. Uh, I that timed out so well. I remember the conversation I had calling you to talk to you about Coalition Nine and yeah, what was going on yeah. in my crazy brain, and you're like, hmm, actually, the timing of this is really good. <laughs> And yes. so uh, talk about now what you do with J. Grain Associates, some of the things that you're finding a lot of passion in and the services that you provide your clients. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, executive life and leadership coaching is huge. Like it's, mm -hmm. it, and coaching means something different to a lot of different people. I did a ton of research with healthcare executives before I started this to just understand what the language meant to them and, and what the model looked like if they were looking for a coach, um, have, you know, case they ever needed me, you know, and I've been just thrilled to be able to walk alongside so many people during, especially this last year, um, I mentioned the burnout and just issues that were within the healthcare ranks and healthcare leadership pre-pandemic. And I have just seen some of the most amazing, smart, and wonderful people really get put through the ringer in the last 15 months. And um, mm -hmm. so I had the opportunity. I work with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we do a lot of the Zoom stuff. If people are you know, local and we've been in and out of, can we meet in the coffee shop or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but we've done a lot of that. And then I have several group collaboratives. So uh, groups of healthcare executives that come together um, and we'll meet like once a month, uh, kind of for like six to nine months and then kind of take a break and then, you know, mix it up a little bit. Um, I also do kind of a lot of uh, writing and some speaking and kind of just some key concepts out there that I get asked about. And lately, a lot of it is around resiliency and burnout and just like, how do you how do you deal with this right now? And so, um, yeah, that's been a big part of kind of what I do. And I'm at coalition yeah. nine. Yeah. I teach a class at Bethel. I mean, it's just a little bit of everything. You have Exciting. what you had, you, you named it a, a portfolio career. And I've used yes. that with other people that have portfolio careers. And when I've said that to those people, they're like, yeah, that is what I have. So you've, I love that statement. Well, yeah, so you have one of my career. clients coined that I have to give full props. Right. She said, I want what you have. A and I was like, what do I have? She's like a portfolio career. I was like, oh yeah, you're right. That's what yeah. it is. I like that. I like that. I like so it. I opened up, I opened this whole thing up with uh, you being the gratitude geek and, okay. and I'm sure our listeners are wondering where the hell did that come from? Yeah. So uh, yeah. where did that come from and where did this, where is this rooted in this, this, um, the science of gratitude and, and your passion for gratitude? Yeah. Well, so first off, um, will credit my oldest daughter as coining the term. She got in the car <laughs> after youth group one night and she was, I was like, oh, what'd you do tonight? And she's like, she's probably 13, 14 at the time. And she's like, oh, mom, we talked about gratitude. And she's like, I told the leader, my mom would love this. She's a gratitude geek. And I was like, oh, I'm a gratitude geek. You're right. And I just like embraced it to just like further, you know, push back against the teenage angst. But the gratitude thing for me has been a journey, I would say, gosh, going back at least six years. So back in my, you know, full-time DTA days, um, part of what we do in the, in the services we offer is um, communications coaching and kind of key communication practices for interacting with other staff and with patients and families. And I always told people like, this isn't charm school. 
I'm not going to like try to tell you to be something you're not, you know, I, I want you to be authentic. But I was working with a group in St. Louis at St. Louis University Hospital, and we started looking into the research behind a lot of the key communication practices, like smiling and, you know, all these other things. And when we got to the gratitude one, I just went real deep in the science piece of it and learned that like there's physical benefits, including like your heart health is better. Um, there's certainly psychological benefits, even, you know, helping with like reducing the effects of trauma and just building resiliency. Um, there's even like vocational things. Like they find that people are more who practice more gratitude are better leaders. They're better networkers. They're better mentors. They're better whatever. And then just on the whole like social side of life, like you tend to have better empathy and all sorts of other stuff. So I became like, oh my gosh, well, like, why wouldn't you practice, you know, gratitude? And so then I changed my tune to the physicians and other people I was, I was like, no, I am going to tell you to do this. Not even because of the yeah. patients and families. I want you to do this for you. And so I started learning about things like, there's this practice out of like, uh, Duke and uh, Martin Sil Seligman, Dr. Seligman kind of came up with this and it's this idea of three good things. And so we would like try to tell people like when you're leaving the park to the parking lot after like a really tough 20, 12 hour shift at the hospital, like what are three good things that happened that day? You can certainly rattle off like the 20 things that didn't go well, but like what's three things that did go well? Talk to your coworkers as you're walking out about that. And then I started to learn about like gratitude journals and I started like doing it myself. Cause I was like, if I'm going to tell people to do this, then I got to do it myself. And so it just began this whole journey of like gratitude journals every morning. And then I bought some for my kids. And so then that's why my daughter was like, you know, gratitude geek. And it just, <laughs> it just continues to the point that like a year ago, my son is the probably the best. He's my youngest. He's 10 and he's the best at the gratitude journaling. And so he is like religious about it. Um, and I kept saying to him, like, I kept trying all these different journals. And finally he's like, mom, you don't really like, you like this about that one and that about that one. And he's like, you just need to make your own. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, just like make your own journal, mom. And I was like, okay, I will. And so like, yeah. I mean, what else was I going to do? So anyway, I got to do that and have that published. It should be like available on Barnes and Noble, hopefully fingers crossed within the month, but look at, I got one oh. sitting right here on my desk. Well, and look, I need to get you one with the new cover too. Oh, I love it. I, so this cool. thing, uh, so one of my questions was going to be, what is your process for, oh. uh, for gratitude journaling? But I'm going to tell you He's something. I don't want you to even talk about it because it's in the book. <laughs> and I, I'll tell you, this gratitude journal is fantastic. And there's, it's daily gratitudes. And then you've got summaries and you've got such a good way of putting this all together that uh, I will, is there a link that I can share in the show notes? Yeah. Is it ready to rock and roll? Link. All right. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do that. And because I think uh, I'm a huge fan of it. I am, uh, I'm a big believer in, uh, in the power of gratitude and, and even, uh, gratitude meditation. Yeah. And so, which is, uh, a, a component of that. And so I mm -hmm. think what you're doing with this and how you're utilizing this into your, not only your, your business, but your life, as you are talking about mm -hmm. with your kids and the effect that you're having on them, and then just the impact that you're going to have on the people you touch. I, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something like it is going to have such a profound effect on all the different lives that you're mm -hmm. going to come intersecting with. And it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love it. I needed to make sure and touch base on this. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. title this podcast, something about gratitude. I don't know what else to do. Something <laughs> with gratitude because uh, this is kind of your thing and, and not yeah. enough people are talking about it. So if, if you can be the person leading the charge, uh, I'm, I'm going to go be right by your side. Awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, can I say one more thing about gratitude? Yeah. I mean, I, you know yeah, yeah. that you've got it. I've got a soapbox. I promise to get off it. But <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I think sometimes when people hear us talk about gratitude and maybe we'll pick on me, maybe they hear me talk about it and they're like, oh, like she's just like positive and it's all about like fluffy positive psychology. And I, I could not disagree more because yes, it is a muscle. I think gratitude is a muscle that we have to build up and you got to do it like every day, um, whether you're writing it down, that is the proven best way. But if you even think about it, talk about it, whatever. Um, but it's, it's not for the days where it's really easy to write the things that you're grateful for. That's actually like, those are kind of like nice days, but throw it is. 
the real true power and gratitude are those days where you're like, I, I have to sit here a minute and think, okay, well, I slept for six hours. I got six hours, you know, like just right. the very, very basics. And sometimes that's all we have. And so when you go through something really awful in your life, or you watch people in your life go through something really hard, this is one of those strategies that like, I'm not a Pollyanna that like rides in and throws a gratitude journal at him. Like, I'm like, no, please build this up in yourself now. So that when we all know those storms are going to come in our lives, but like have it ready. So that when they happen, you have something to draw on and you're kind of already naturally doing that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Off slap yeah. box. I, I, well, down. I'll, I'll, and then I'll just throw a little cherry on the top. I was listening to a, a, a meditation podcast that I listened to mm -hmm. that uh, they were talking about gratitude meditation and, and <sighs> he, and the, he was talking about how, if you have just one of those really shitty days and it's just mm -hmm. like, it was a really rough day. You cannot think of anything. And mm -hmm. you live in the United States and you have running water, just write that down. Like mm -hmm. there's always something to have gratitude for, even if it's, mm -hmm. you know, you have, you have clean air to breathe. Like there's so many mm -hmm. different things that you can have gratitude for. So yeah. I, I will be a little bit Pollyanna on that because I think that there's, there is things yeah. that you can look at a day and just, if you just got to dig a little deeper and have a positive outlook on things. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So on that Absolutely. note, uh, I will, uh, I'll hard transition to our <laughs> nine questions, uh, because, well, okay, I'm ready. I, I'm ready. That, uh, that was, a, I could talk about that stuff all day. And, uh, I know, can you, me too. can you confirm to me that you did not see, or, or we didn't talk about any of these crazy questions and I'm a fire your way. No, I'm a little like excited and nervous at the same time. Cause I have no clue what you're about to ask me. Well, I was thrilled that you said you listened to all the podcasts. And I will also <laughs> say, because you said that, you kind of dug your own grave here a little bit. I'm throwing ah! two, new one, two new ones at you. Yes. Mm, okay. <laughs> so I try and repeat Shoot. some of them just to give some some people uh, a little bit of reprieve. So you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about here. All right. So number one, uh, what was your favorite TV show growing up? Family Ties. Family ties. I don't know why I feel like I have to answer quickly. We're not, we're not yeah. on like a, no. this isn't time, yeah. but yeah. Uh, I, I'll, I'll breathe. I think, uh, people had a love hate relationship with Alex P. Keaton. Uh, I know. Were, were you a big mm -hmm. fan or no? I was a fan in, yeah. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I was a fan. <laughs> I just loved the whole show. I've tried yeah, to watch right. my kids, have my kids watch it now and it doesn't totally hold up, but they tackled some pretty large topics in the, that first season, especially. I went back and was like, woo, okay, really? that's awesome. All right, all right. Well, people got to listen to that. Uh, all right, yeah. number two, what is one thing on your bucket list? Oh, my bucket list. Um, I don't know if I can pull it off for a really long time, but at some point I would like to live in Carmel for, it might just Ooh. be a summer or a winter. Mm -hmm. That might be a post-graduation of the children uh, type yes. of thing that you're going to do. And once yes. you, once you have more of a portfolio career, exactly. You can, exactly. You, by that time, by that time, you'll be able to work anywhere. You can do this now oh, work yeah. anywhere in the world, but by that time, yeah, you I can work will. anywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, what is your favorite hobby? Um, Besides gratitude journaling. Yes. Um, I normally say traveling and I got to think about this. I don't, can't say that I developed some new amazing hobby during COVID. So, and if I look at what our family is doing this summer, um, we're kind of getting back at what travel we can do. So traveling is my hobby. Yeah. You run too, don't you? Oh, I do. I don't yeah. love it. <laughs> No one chases me, but, um, true story. I went for a walk yesterday and then I had like just some stuff go on and I needed to go for a run later. And I went down my loop and this guy who I don't know, but I see every day, he's like, Hey, you already came by here today. I was like, Oh yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like, sometimes you just got to keep like getting out. I think the correct response to that is, Hey, mind your own business. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I turned around and he's like, you go girl. And I was like, oh, oh, all right. Well, then, as long as he was cheering you on, that's okay. As long yeah. as he wasn't creepy. All no. right. Uh, if you could be any animal, what would you be and why? Oh my gosh. <laughs> we just talked about this as a family recently. And I don't remember what I said. Um, that is a whole other topic. I'm going to go with... I think I had something that was at the top of the food chain, so I didn't have to worry about things eating me. Um, but for some reason this morning, sloth comes to mind, just to be able to lay down and relax. I'll tell you, those, those uh, first of all, those are amazing animals, and they're just some of the cutest little guys. Aww. And they just move at the most uh, interesting pace. But yeah, uh, if you can, if anybody watches a documentary on sloths, you'll have a whole nother uh, appreciation for what, totally. what they contribute to uh, our environment. All right. What is the average time you go to bed? And what is the <laughs> average time you wake up? Whew. Um, I think I go to bed. I aim for 1030. It becomes 11, 1130. And I try to get up at six lately. I get up a lot earlier. So I think that's a summer thing. Uh, my wife and Is I it? were talking about that. Yeah. So I get up like early anyway, but in the winter time, I'm up at like maybe five 30 quarter to six in the summertime. Yeah. I'm up at like four 30. It's How dumb. Was this morning. I was like, do yeah. try to sleep. Yeah. Nope. Just got up and went going. Yeah. I blame my son. Yeah. I blame <laughs> my son. Uh, all right. What is the lowest grade you, that you've ever received and in, in what oh, class? <laughs> Oh my gosh. That's a new one. And I love it. <laughs> I don't know if it is the lowest grade, but it definitely sticks out as a low grade. So mm -hmm. I mentioned that I was in college at that school in Pennsylvania and I needed to transfer back. And you had to take like a physical education class as like some stupid requirement as a freshman. And I'm not super, like we said, people don't chase me, but I will run, but I am not athletic in any way, shape or form. And like, for whatever the reason, I had like a B in this dude's class and I was like, I'm transferring and I needed like my credits to be up. I went in and like argued for a B plus or something just because I couldn't handle the B on the transcript because I don't know what it meant for scholarships or something. So I'll tell I'm going to go with B. B, uh, man, I failed my computer programming class in high school and- <sighs> Oh man. Uh, so you <laughs> is nothing compared to I was to a total my, geek, but I mean, I, my yeah. gong show of a, of a high school career. So, um, <laughs> and I'm a college dropout. So you're like 10 times, uh, no. ahead of me on all that. So your B in physical education, I would have got, I yes. would have got an A plus it just so you know, I would have got yeah, an A plus see? on that. Yeah. We all have our strengths. That one is yeah. not, and was not mine. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's move away from that one. Uh, what <laughs> is the what is the last book you read? That I completed. No, um, you don't have to say completed. Like, even if you're in the middle of a book now, uh, what is the last book you read? Okay, this is really embarrassing, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, <laughs> I when I'm out on my runs and my walks. I find those little book, you know, mobile, like those little book. Oh yeah. Cases the, that are in yeah, the, 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 the neighborhood. The neighborhood books. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So recently I picked up two books out of one of them. And so I had to like jog home with it on. Um, one is about um, Michael J. Fox. And I cannot remember the name of his book, but it's like his biography from probably 15 years ago. So to pull our family ties thing full yeah, circle. We're bringing this but the full other circle, one is like the world according to Tom Hanks. And I am two thirds of the way through it. And I finally looked at my kids last week and I was like, I've never not finished a book. I can't finish it. The dude wrote the book and he never interviewed Tom Hanks. All he did is pull like crap from People Magazine and all this stuff. It's like a stupid book. No wonder it was in the little, you know, case in the neighborhood. And so uh, it is in the bag to go back because oh, I love it. someone else can have fun with that one. I love Tom Hanks, but all of a sudden I was like, this is just like reading People Magazine over and over and over. I'm good. Your, so your I need some better literature is the bottom. Your, your transparency in this is fantastic. The fact that you brought up Michael J. Fox twice uh, in this podcast and 
uh, we're honest about those books is fantastic. And it says so much about your personality. <laughs> oh, people uh, are going to be like, I, I do not want to talk to her. <laughs> uh, I disagree 100%. All right. Uh, number eight, describe your 20s in one sentence. <sighs> one sentence or one word? One sentence. One, sentence. one word is, is tough. Or making or up for sentence. lost time does that work making it for last time my grad yeah. school is what a college experience usually is uh good does that all make right. sense making up for lost time i like that mm -hmm. well said mm -hmm. uh all right final question when i say the word mentor who do you think of and why oh good question oh there's a lot of people um you can only choose one Dang. Okay. Um, there's a man named Daryl who I was, um, who I worked with at Alina and we were formally like they did a 360 thing and then they assigned you a mentor, but I clearly got like the, one of the best people in terms of developing other leaders. So he and I are very, very different in a lot of different ways, but on the like strengths finder thing, he's definitely like a developer. And so he really taught me that as a mentor, you can really speak into someone's life. Um, even if like your skill sets are really different or your interests are really different or just even personality and stuff is really different. And so, um, yeah, I think he, we had a formal mentorship for a long time and then he was just gracious enough to keep meeting with me for years after that. So um, that's who comes to mind. Yeah, that's kind of how mentorship works, right? It turns into more of a relationship of of based in friendship and trust mm -hmm. and and trans transparency, vulnerability, and and it doesn't have to be structured, right? It can just be a couple of people chatting every once in a while. So yeah. that is a that's a very broad word, right? It is. It is. Yeah. yeah. Well, Janice, uh, I have so much gratitude for having <laughs> you uh, not only in my life but as a part of the Coalition Nine community and all the the fantastic things that you're doing for your clients and the people that you touch uh, and also for being on this podcast. So thank you so much for sharing thanks, your story Aaron. and all the great things that you, you bring to the community. Oh, thanks so much for having me. It's been such a great, um, a great thing to be part of the coalition nine group in this last season, especially. And I just love all the work that you're doing. So thrilled to be a part of it. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, uh, I am so happy to have you on the podcast. So, on behalf of Janie's Gray, this has been the Power of Nine podcast. I am your host, Aaron Eggert, and I want to thank you for the privilege of your time.